Oh look, a father's love. So this is one of my favorite ads here. That's that's Nick. I know you don't recognize him because he has dark hair. And that little cutie patootie is that cutie patootie right there. That is the day we took CJ home from the hospital. And I love this for a few reasons. One, Nick looks tired. <laughs> But he didn't know the tired that was to come <laughs> because when you're in the hospital, you got help and once you go home You don't have any help and then you're just super duper tired And he just looks like so happy, right? He just looks like nothing could happen that would spoil my day today. I'm taking my baby home And I thought man, I like this picture because it means a lot to me But I like it because of what it means and I think about what our father thinks of us So that's what I'm going to talk about today the father's love there are many names for God. We have a few of them here. Elohim, my creator. That's a good one for father, right? Somebody who made you. Jehovah, my Lord, El Shaddai, my supplier. Adonai, my master. Jehovah Jireh, my provider. Oh, that's a good one, especially now. Providing some breath while we're singing is good. But glasses and mask. That's all. Moving on. Um, Jehovah Rafe, my healer. Again, with the wrong at sea. I got it. Have anybody watched the Golden Girls? Like Sophia had no filter, right? Though I don't recommend it. Don't do it. It's not going to get you closer to Jesus. But Sophia had like no filter. And the older I get, that's kind of how I end up. But anyway, Jehovah Nisi, my banner. Jehovah Makadesh, my sanctifier. Those are fabulous things that God is. That is what God is to us. But the most important name you can call him is Abba. That means Daddy. It means somebody who's so close to you. Someone who you can go and tell your problems to. Someone who's going to pick you up when you skin your knee. Someone who's going to play with you and have fun with you. The Bible says, because one of the things that I've always been cautious on Mother's Day and Father's Day, um, or any other holidays, really, because if this is not what it means to you, and if this is not a happy time for you, then are you just left out? What if you had a dad that was terrible? What if you had a dad? What if you were a dad that wasn't as great as what you could have been? What if there's guilt associated with the day? I'm here to tell you that's not what we're talking about. All of that is covered under the blood, but better than any earthly father could ever be. Now, I had a great dad. Nick is a great dad. Joe is a great dad. I'll speak to my own family. They still aren't as good as our Heavenly Father is to us. And good news for you today you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received, you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Abba is the most intimate name. The Jewish kids still use it to call their dads. That's still what they use today, which I think would be cool. That would be like the one Jewish word that I know. It also entails protection. As nice as you see Nick and Joe back there, and they are lovely people, and they're very nice, and Joe will show you to your seat, and Nick will play songs for you. And as nice as they are, they are nice up until you come against their family. And then we see a whole other side of Nick and Joe. Because part of that love is protection. Part of that love says, this is, this is mine, and you don't touch it. And doesn't that remind you of that Psalm 91? Yeah. Doesn't that remind you of under his wings? Mm -hmm. Will you find your protection? Jesus, when he came to earth, let's go, John 17, 6. This was the, he was in the Garden of Gethsemane before he went to be. I'm going to throw that on the ground. It's not time to drop my mic, so I dropped the clicker. The, I, the Garden of Gethsemane, the day before he was crucified, he's going, he's talking to God. And he's like, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they've kept your word. What was the name that he was manifesting when he was here? The names that I talked about before were well manifested in the Old Testament. They talked about Abba and the Father in the Old Testament. But what Jesus came, in my opinion, to believe, to bring manifestation of, the name of God that's more important than all the other names because it encompasses all of them, is Daddy. Amen. Jesus prayed to God for the protection of the people that he had charge over when he was here. And this is how he prayed it. Holy Father, keep through your name, your Abba name, those who you've given me so that they can be one as we are. You're part of the family. 
whether you had an earthly dad, you didn't have an earthly dad, you know who your earthly dad is, you don't know, you had an earthly dad that should be up on a pedestal. The Holy One, the one who created us all, loves you and loves you intimately. And Jesus even prayed for the protection of his people that he was, knew he was about to leave behind through Abba. This is just statistics. See, a senior criminal, criminologist at Cambridge University said that the crimes committed by teenage children, of all the crimes, the common denominators that they had at the time of the study, 60% were committed by dropouts, 70% by those that were on drugs. But the greatest determining factor were those that grew up without a father. So that's scary, right? So what, because there's a father that was in the home, but did you know that you can have a dad that's in the home that's not present in the home? That was very prevalent in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s. Dads weren't like hands-on like they are today. I didn't see it. My dad thought he had a fabulous dad, but you never heard him saying, oh yeah, we were out playing and did this or did that. That never happened. My dad put food on the table and clothes on my back and spanked me when I was wrong. And that's all that you heard about my grandfather pretty much doing for the kids. And dad thought he was great. But our dad had tea parties. Our dad <laughs> cleaned the house when we would go to skating. And did, we used to skate tie, found Nick. I recommend it to everybody, roller skating. We should bring it back. Started here at FFOP, bring it back roller skating. I can't do that now though, did you know that? I used to roller skate. I'll show you a picture if you haven't seen it. You are in for a treat. That's how I found Nick. We were middle school, I think, when we stopped. But I skated, like, you know how there's Olympics ice skating? Back in the day, there was roller skating like that. Maybe there still is, I don't know. And we did that. Chris did it too. She was cute. Oh, I think she had Princess Leia buns. We was her little hair. So cute. Well, she's straight up like Julia. Anywho. <laughs> We have hope today, though, because our Heavenly Father is well able to care for us. These statistics don't have to be our statistics. But the point of you receiving God as your Father and not just some far-off guy who is, Oh, Holy Father, I come to you now and tell you all my sins. I talked last week. Run to your dad. Don't, don't come in shame and embarrass. Just run to your dad. I'm going to talk about the parable of the prodigal son. And I may rename this after, just an FYI. It's found in Luke 15, 11 to 32. I like to pull the scripture apart a bit. And because I've heard this song, this song, I don't know, is there a song? I've heard this story since I was, what, four or five years old. And the story that I've always heard is, is about a guy who leaves and comes back and his dad welcomes him back, right? And he's repentant. But then you read it and you're like, wait a second, that's not exactly how it happened. First of all, the story's not even about the guy. The story's about the dad. There was a man who had two sons. So Jesus starts off by saying the most important thing. A man who had two sons. So what does that mean? A father. In my opinion, the story is a representation of what our God, our dad, feels about us. So look at that while we're reading it today. Don't just turn off and think that you know the story. The younger son, so he has two sons. The younger little, little hooker snapper says, one said to his father, give me my share of the estate. In the Jewish culture, and really any culture, if you ask for your inheritance before you're dead, then what does that mean? You don't care whether your dad's alive or dead. All you want is that cash. That's all you care about, right? But then if you read the next part, he said, so his dad gave it to him. He divided his property between them. So he had two sons. And if you've read ahead and you've heard the story before, then you know that that second son, who was the firstborn, is sour. He's sour about this entire story. But just to point out, in the Jewish culture, the firstborn gets double portions. So two-thirds of the estate went to his first son. The second son got one-third. Moving on. It's kind of like, I don't know, I can't let stuff like that go. Kind of like the wise men at Christmas. You'll see. So not long after, the younger son got together all he had. He set off for a distant country. Well, of course he did. He didn't want to be home. Um, he set off for a distant country and squandered all his wealth and wild living. And that's where I think we get this whole crazy, you know, prodigal idea from. After he had spent everything he had, after he had spent everything he had, after he had spent everything he had, there was a famine in the whole country. And he began to be in need. What was he in need of? Hmm, food. 
shelter. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of the country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. In Jewish religion and culture, pigs, unclean, you don't touch a pig. You sure don't want to get in there and slop and feed the pigs. Super duper no-no, right? He longed to fill his stomach with even the food that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Probably because he's in with the pigs. When he came to his senses, he said, I am so sorry that I left my dad's house because, man, do I miss my dad and I love my dad and I wish he could just throw his arms around me and tell me that everything's going to be okay and I feel horrible about what I've done. Nope. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. He just wanted a way out. That's all he wanted. He had no idea about repenting. But I'll go back. I'll pack. I'll go back to my father and say to him, here's a speech. Here's his whole speech. He's got a plan. Father, I sinned against heaven and you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. That sounds like a good speech, right? But perhaps insincere, but it's a good speech. It'll probably get you where you need to go. So he got up and he went to his father. So what caused him to go home? His belly. Not his heart, his belly. His belly caused him to go home. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. So did he get to tell a speech before his father was filled with compassion? He didn't. He had compassion when he just saw him, when he just saw him a long way off. And again, why did he see him a long way off? Because he was looking. He probably heard about the famine when he was out like, I know that kid. He surely has to please God bring him home. I know he is not doing okay because we know that he's not mature. He's out looking for him, longing for his return. After the kid said, I don't care if you're alive or dead. Doesn't matter to me. I just want the money. But the father's love, not based on the child, based on what the father wanted. The father wanted his son to return home. So he ran to his son. He threw his arms around him and kissed him. In the Jewish culture, if you're over 30, you don't run. If you're dignified, you don't run. But they just walked everywhere, so that was their big thing. So, so far, last week, we have that Jesus likes carbs because he made bread. And this week, we don't run. Okay? So, I'm just saying. That's all I'm saying. I'm just going to leave that for you and you be led of God, whatever you need to do. They did, however, walk miles a day. But I'm not going to bring that up right now. So, anyway, so he ran to his son. So, this old guy pulls up his long robe. There's the undignified part. And he takes off running. And he threw his arms around his son and he kissed him. And that word kissed is like, not like a, it is a kiss lavishly many, many times. Like kissing all over. Let's not forget where the kid was. The kid was with pigs, slopping the hogs. Nick lived on a pig farm at one point in his life. Not a good smell. Not great for your first date. Just going to say. And then he left there and he walked all the way back home. Because remember, he was in a far off country. He's still there. It's now he's home. So he's probably muddy and gross and bloody. And his dad does not even care. He just throws his arms around his baby. And he's like, here we go. The son said to him, here's a speech. Father, I sinned against heaven in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be, to be called your son. That's as far as it gets. I'm going to say to you, what is this story about? I'm going to have to say it's a story of love. It's not about the lost. It's not about the father, about the, I'm sorry, about the child who came home and decided to come home repentant. The story is about the dad who was looking for his kid because he knew he needed help. The story is about a love that didn't die because you stole my, you took my money, wished me dead, took my money and left me here with a cranky older kid, by the way. It's a story of love. It's not about someone who left and come back. It's somebody who's standing there waiting, praying, waiting for you, for whatever mess you're in, whatever it is. You may not be stinky and dirty, but guess what? You may be the kid whose dad just yelled at him for being on video games too long. You might be the kid whose dad and mom just said, you have got to clean your room. You've got to go take a shower. You stink. Come on. You may be feeling rejected like that. Let me tell you, First of all, please do those things. Society appreciates those things. But secondly, if you're feeling like you are unloved by your earthly father, even in that regard, you got Jesus who's there waiting to love you, even in your filth and even in your stink. And I'll give you a hug after you shower. 
<laughs> Renee Spitz was a psychoanalyst. What he did was he went and he studied what happens with people in life, right? So he, there was an orphanage that was open, and this is a study from a while ago. There was an orphanage that was open, and they had 97 kids that were just freshly brought in. They were between the ages of three years old and three months old. It was a very busy orphanage. They had time to clean you, to clothe you, and to feed you. They did not have time to rock you gently, sing a lullaby, pat your little head, kiss your scraped knee. They didn't have time for any of that. They had your basic needs met, and that's it. That's all that they had time to do. He, saw, he didn't do anything, didn't pick up a baby. He just watched. At one month, now these, these are kids who came in healthy, so they did not have any known disease when they came in. At one month, they were starting to not eat well and not sleeping. Some of them, not all. At five months, they would, when you would walk in, you would cry. They would, you would hear the cries uncontrollably. And if you go to, if you did go to pick them up, to console them, they screamed even louder because they had no idea what you were doing. At five months, just after that long a time. At one year, a third of them were no longer on Earth. They had been starved from the part that they needed. You need food. You need water. You need shelter. You need to be changed. But you need that physical love. You need that touch. You need to know that you matter in the world. Amen. I, I pulled this out because, let's say you're a loner. Let's say you live by yourself. Let's say you choose to not ever be touched. Let's say you're like, no thank you. I'm good. Do not touch me. There's a few of you in the audience, I know. I'm related to a couple of them. Not Nick and CJ. I just do it anyway. If you have made a, a circle around yourself before the Rona, and you made a circle around yourself that nobody can come in, then I want you to know, and you're like, oh, you know, maybe I shouldn't have done that. I want you to know, it says on here that this was a story, and the story's not important. Here's what's important. There was a disciple who was speaking, and the Holy Spirit fell on all who were listening to the message. Kind of what happened when Toya was singing today. And you could sense the physical presence that was in the room. Even though God is always here, the Holy Spirit is always here. You could sense it stronger than normal. That word that the Holy Spirit fell on all those who were listening, that word fell is the same word as the word embrace in the prodigal story. So if you have created your, a little island for yourself, you have the Holy Spirit that's there that can hold you and who can feed you what you need spiritually and emotionally. And that's when that one's out there. Back to my story. So the father said to his servants, after listening to his partial speech, the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. At that time, the best robes were held only for traveling dignitaries. Now this man had a lot of money because most people did not have servants back then. But he Clearly he had servants. He had a big estate to disperse among a couple of kids. He had a really nice robe. So this child got through one sentence of his speech. Said, he says, bring the best robe and put it on him. Think, just think about that for a second. He's muddy, he's dirty, he's stinky. I would probably require a shower first because this is the best robe. And it's not like you can throw stuff in the laundry. It was hard to clean and stuff back then. He didn't care. He said, put up the best robe on him. That's John 15, 22. In Isaiah, we go back and we look. What does that mean to us? There's a scripture that talks about you. I will rejoice in the Lord. My soul will be joyful in my God. He, the Lord, capital H, hath clothed me with garments of salvation. He's covered me with a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments, and the bride adorns herself with jewels. I think the last wedding I attended was Bonnie and Bruno's wedding. I thought I saw some pictures of another cool one. And man, on that day, I've, I've known Bonnie a lot of years, <laughs> and I've never seen her look as beautiful as that day. She had the this and the that, and beautiful, and the, the makeup, oh my goodness, she looked beautiful. Bruno, dressed like a sharp dressed man. Looking gorgeous, right? Their very best. And it says that God does that to you. It doesn't say God makes you shower and then he covers you with a robe of righteousness. He says, no, here, take it. Take it. The next thing he did, he put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. 
A ring at that time was a sign of authority. It was a sign of a seal. So the kid squandered all he had. He was not doing what he was supposed to do. But based on nothing that the kid did, because remember, here's what the kid did. He walked up and he got through one, one line of a speech. And he said, bring the ring. Give him back the authority that he threw away. Give him that back. Put sandals on his feet. I thought this was interesting. There are two words for sandals, and one's like an everyday, perhaps a casual sandal. And then the other one is a fancy sandal. And he said, give him the fancy sandals, which is good because it goes with the robe, right? So God does care about what you wear, apparently. You gotta, you know, you may stink, but you can look good. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and he was found. He was lost and now he is found. So they began to celebrate. <coughs> And it didn't sound like a small party because when the older kid heard, heard this party, he goes to the service and he's like, what's this? Which tells you a little bit about the older kid because he's never been to a party ever, like um, singing and dancing. It's a party, buddy. And so he's like, what is going on here? Because the party was so great. Because why? Because the guy walked down the road. Because why? Because the father's love. The kid was not repentant. The kid was hungry. The kid got fed. The kid got a robe. The kid got authority. The kid got pretty shoes. I think this is interesting. Where was Jesus when he was telling this story? It says the first part of the chapter. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them? So here's who's in the room. The sinners and the saints, right? The scribes, the Pharisees, and probably the dirty people in the world. The people who are tax collectors, the people who have a, are ill reproach. And they're all in the room. And so these are the stories that he decides to tell people. I wonder who it hit more. I wonder if it was the low lives that weren't even supposed to be in the same room as the scribes and Pharisees. Or I wonder if it was the scribes and Pharisees that had never felt that love in their life. Maybe both. When he sat down, first he did was he told the story of the lost sheep. And just a quick recap if you've not heard it. It's basically a shepherd that has 100 sheep. One gets lost, and so he leaves the 99 and goes and gets the one. And so that all sounds right, that any shepherd's going to do that, right? Once he finds the one and brings it back, then he goes to his friends and he says, Hey, rejoice with me because I found my sheep. If you have 99 sheep and you're a shepherd and you lose one and then you find it again, do we really think a lot of celebration is going on? Actually, probably not because it's a sheep. There's another story about the lost coin. A lady has coins and she loses one. Now, I think it was equivalent of a day's wages, so I'd be a little upset too. But once she finds a coin, then she calls her friends and says, hey, rejoice with me, I found a coin. Does that really actually happen? No. And the next one that happens is the story of the lost son. If your son has called you every single name in the book, said, I wish you were dead, give me your money, bye now, and he comes back, do you think that the average person's gonna celebrate that? No. This is the order that Jesus told these stories in. Because what God deems important is what's important. And guess what? He deemed that we are all important. Amen. We're all important enough to put on whatever level we are away from him and we come back, whichever area that is, whether it be emotional, spiritual, physical level that we have distanced ourselves from him, he's just happy that we show up and he's like, let me help you out. Amen. Amen. I like this. This is a, a passage very poetic out of Zephaniah and I think it really mirrors what the story of the prodigal son is Zephaniah 3 14 or 17 so as I read it think about what we just heard I also shouldn't have had the second cup of coffee you get out early today sing O daughter of Zion I'm like we need to have a moment for praise zing sing <laughs> when you're in the mass I get it Sing, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart. I could slow down. Our daughter of, O daughter of Jerusalem, the Lord has taken away your judgments. He has cast out your enemy. The king of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall see disaster no more. In that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, don't fear. Let not your hand be weak after your long journey. Let your God, let the Lord your God is in your midst. The mighty one will say, he will rejoice over you with gladness. He'll hug your neck. He will quiet you with his love. That reminds me of a baby 
when they're just crying because they need something. He's just like, shh, 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 hush, hush, hush. He'll quiet you with his love, and he'll rejoice over you with singing. Like in the prodigal, when we had singing and dancing at a huge party, when you came back, a few things that we have, and I know I, I have things like this almost every week, but I tell you, it's good. The law demands righteousness. Once Jesus came and paid the price, this is what we have. Instead of the old law, we have our new grace. We have our new robe. Under our new robe, the law demanded righteousness. Grace provides righteousness as a free gift. You don't have to do anything. It's yours. Just take it. The law said, keep all the commandments, or God's not going to bless you. You have to be as perfect as you can be, and then you'll get your stuff. Grace says, actually, Jesus kept all the laws. You don't have to worry about keeping all the laws. I'm going to give you my blessing as a free gift. CJ's about to turn 14. Moment of silence for CJ's year. Um, CJ's about to turn 14, the first week of July, July 5th. He doesn't have to earn the gift that I'm going to give him. It's just a gift because he was born. And by the way, he didn't do any work. Ten pounds, kid, by, God, by the way, guys. He was almost ten pounds. I just think I should be a gift this whole time. The law says, I will never forget your sins. Grace says, I will remember your sins no more. You don't even got to bring him up because he has no idea what you're talking about. Under the law, Moses was told to remove his sandals because he was on holy ground. What does Grace say? Your sandals, you are worthy to stand in my presence. You are worthy. Take the good shoes. Stand there. Stand there proud of who you are. And who you are is because of who I am. Amen. It's not because of how you walked in. It's not because of how you walked out. It's because of who I am in you. Amen. You're worthy. I see Jesus. I see you through the blood of Jesus. I see my son. I see my daughter. Amen. Okay, I'm going to admit something to you. What's today? Sunday. Until Monday, if you'd asked me then, what does the word prodigal mean? I would have said it's somebody who lost, who was lost and came back. It's actually not the meaning of it. I'm, I'm not a good English student apparently either. What it actually means is, the word prodigal means having or giving something on a lavish scale. So, if that's the case, then shouldn't this be called the prodigal father? Should the story be about the love and the lavish love that God has bestowed on us Amen. that we did nothing at all for? Amen. I mean, I'm not going to like cross out my Bible or anything, but the little heading <laughs> should maybe be changed in our thought process. Because the kid did do a lot. He lavishly, wildly spent all that he had. But the important part of the story, in my opinion, is what the father did. And his love, and his lavish love. In 1992, 1992, some of y'all were around at that time, and maybe you were watching the Olympics. There was a man named Derek Redman, and he was in the 400 meter semifinal race. He was running the Olympics, big deal, right? And he pulls a hamstring, and he goes down. Bad day, right? All of his hopes and dreams are dashed. He he knows that this is an injury that he's not going to come back from. He knows that the race is going to be done. I brought a video, and I want you to watch the video. And the reason why I want you to watch the video is because I want you to look at it through this. I want you to look at it through the eyes of the father. Because what you will see is not some guy who fell and stayed down and then decided he was going to finish the race. I want you to look at the dad and watch what the people try to do with the dad and what the dad's response is. And then I'll come back. Go ahead.
I love that. I watched it maybe 10 times, just not get emotional when I was watching it here and didn't work. Because I love it because the dad is like, come here, buddy. Let me help you finish your race. I didn't train for that race. He just loved his kid and knew what he was going to do. It was clear what the kid's intention was. The kid was what running now. He's like, here, you lean on my shoulder. Let my legs be your legs. And if anything comes away, go back. And I don't know what he said, but they stopped coming. I don't know what tone he had, but my guess is it wasn't like, oh, I got this. It's like, nope, I'm, I'm good. He's going. And then I like the end part. He, he's walking through and his, this, the dad's head is up. And he's standing there with shoulders back and head is up. And he taps his boy on the belly. He's like, that's my kid. That's my kid. He may not finish his race, but this is my kid. My kid's the one who is going to finish this race. My kid may not be the one who won, but my kid's got the spirit that I'm proud of. And I think it's so touching. It's just a good visual of our Father's love for us. When you are down, he will carry you. When you need him, whether you know it or not, he is there watching the whole time. Kind of like the mom who sends her kid off to school, says, honey, you can walk to school no problem, but yet she's hiding behind the bushes the whole way, looking to make sure he got where he's supposed to go. That's our God. He's, he's out for us. He's there for you. And if Father's Day does not have a good connotation for you, and you can't call your dad today, or no one's calling you, you do have a dad. You have an Abba Father. Call on him today. Amen. Have him minister to you today. And wherever you are, whether you're on top of the mountain or you're in the valley, he's proud of you. Somebody said once that God, God loves you so much, he's got your picture on his refrigerator. And I thought, that's just so, such a good, touching thing. I'm moving some stuff around in my house. And those are the things that are important to me. The things that Julia and Joseph and CJ made when they were little and spelled it wrong and had their D's backwards. Those are the things that I cherish now. When they didn't know any better and they were just doing whatever they did because they loved me. Those are the things that I like to keep. So.